East of Sugar Loaf, a 1st Marine Division battalion commander who had been ordered to take a fiercely fortified hill, objected that his men were all used up, half of them belong in sick bay. The assistant divisional commander replied that the battalion commander, a lieutenant colonel, had his orders, and that heads would roll if they weren't obeyed. The latter saluted and left, eyes tearing. We'll take the hill, he told an intelligence officer, but I don't care if I come off it or not. The hill was taken, and the battalion commander wasn't wounded until later. The men obeyed. Incidents of refusal, even of corporal's orders, were astonishingly few. Whitaker was among the overwhelming majority who never saw or heard of one, or of cowardice. Not to advance when ordered was inconceivable for all but a statistically negligible minority. Almost no one wanted to charge the frightening danger, and only a small minority volunteered for especially hazardous assignments. A young Marine named Declan Klingenhagen was lucky enough to be skipped by his sergeant for what may have been the twelfth assault on Sugar Loaf. I was sitting in a trench dug out of the bottom of a small hill, and I was apprehensive. I wasn't hiding because there were other Marines around, but I hoped no one would see me. I guess I was feeling fear. At one point, a longer-time member of my squad saw me and asked why I wasn't going with the assault. The sergeant was nearby and told the member to leave me alone. It was all right. The sergeant knew Klingenhagen's very first action as a replacement on Sugarloaf three days earlier had put him in a kind of shock. A mortar barrage killed his lieutenant and so ravaged his squad that only four men were able to withdraw. One of the four was badly wounded. Another lasted only until he reached the bottom of the hill, when he fell dead at Klingenhagen's feet with a bullet hole in his chest. Yet although the eighteen-year-old private sure hoped it wouldn't happen, he also knew he'd go up again if ordered. A seasoned military maxim posits that a combat unit that has taken casualties of thirty percent or more can't sustain its fighting spirit. Many frontline units on Okinawa went far above that, Whitaker's 29th Regiment to 82%. However true it was, as many Japanese survivors later saw it, that Americans won their assured victory largely by applying their greatly superior resources, it's thus also true that those at the killing edge behaved exceptionally. Another old adage that war is 90% logistics didn't diminish their record of surpassing courage and esprit de corps. Dick Whitaker was among the majority to whom it never occurred not to obey every order, and his wounds had been relatively trifling so far. Two days after his charge up Sugar Loaf on May 14th, he and his platoon's other survivors were on the back slope of a little rise a hundred yards north. Exhausted and numb, they'd lost all their machine guns on the hill. Whitaker knew the wasted platoon would be ordered up again soon, but maybe not now, maybe not until tomorrow. That was all the future they could contemplate. Whitaker dug his foxhole deeper and stuck his shovel in the mud to light a cigarette. He leaned down toward a buddy's match, his left hand remaining on the shovel's handle. A sniper's bullet caught it there, exactly where his heart had been a second earlier. He made his own way to his battalion aid station, about half a mile to the rear. Cleaned and dressed, his wound seemed less serious than when the bullet struck. Three days later, a doctor pronounced him fit for duty, and he returned to his unit, which was even smaller because it had charged sugar loaf again in his absence. A month to the day after Whitaker was hit, Marine Corps headquarters in Washington wrote his parents that he'd been wounded in action against the enemy on, this was mistaken by two days, May 18. Your anxiety is realised, and you may be sure that any additional details or information received will be forwarded to you at the earliest possible moment. That moment came more than a month later, when the campaign was over and Whitaker was back on Guam. The new note informed that he'd been returned to duty on May 20th. Two weeks later, the 4th and 29th Marine Regiments attacked the Oroku Peninsula, site of Naha Airfield, and of the tunnels of the Naval Base Force and Captain Kojo's regimental headquarters. The day after their amphibious landing there, on June 4th, Whitaker's platoon dodged small arms fire while advancing along the top of a ridge. When they came upon a forward artillery spotter peering through his binoculars, Whitaker asked what his objective was, 
the lieutenant handed him his glasses, through which he made out three Japanese soldiers studying a map on the next ridge. Watch this, said the spotter, calling in some coordinates by radio. Moments later, the platoon heard American shells whizzing overhead. The three Japanese disappeared, together with the entire top of the ridge. Whitaker woke up in an Amtrak about half an hour later with no memory of how he got there. It might have been after being hit by a short round from an American gun. His head ached badly, blood flowed from his nose, and he couldn't hear. He supposed he was in the hands of a Graves registration team, since the vehicle was also transporting poncho-wrapped bodies. In fact, he was being evacuated to a hospital ship, where he had his second hot meal. He'd never find out what had caused his concussion. He told his shipboard examiners that he didn't feel too bad, and was returned to a regimental hospital ashore. After a night there, he was checked again at his battalion aid station, which turned him loose to return to his outfit. Part of him knew he'd come through alive, and without a disabling or disfiguring wound. Another part accepted how unlikely that was. All those people around you were getting hit. Your turn just had to come too. Although every infantryman still secretly believed he was the exception whose turn would never come, all knew the heavy odds against that. You do get letters from home and you keep reading them, Norris Buckter of Connecticut would reflect. But you've lost the feeling that you'll ever be back in that other world. You get to a time when you're resigned to your own death coming sooner or later. That only makes sense. Evan Regal, a lad from a struggling New York farm, felt certain it was a question of time. You might survive this battle or that, but sooner or later they'd get you. That was unavoidable. I tried not to think about it. I knew guys who had premonitions they were going to get it the next day. And often enough, that's when they actually did get killed. Regal was the classic combat schizophrenic operating on reason, which told him the odds and faith which obscured them. But solicitous Mommy Damar observed his men gradually tilting toward pessimism. After a while you've seen so much death and you expect your own has got to come sooner or later. You're there for just one thing, to kill until you get killed. Until you get killed wasn't fanciful, since Americans in the Pacific, like Soviets in World War II, didn't go home after serving a year or two but stayed for the duration, which usually ended in their death or wounds serious enough to merit their evacuation. Or in breakdown, for although their spirits very rarely refused to obey an order, their nervous systems failed more often. Few Americans considered how demoralising their resources and firepower were to the Japanese. Fewer Japanese questioned the assumption that the Americans' material superiority gave them an easy time. The truth is that the relentless defence of a well-fortified enemy determined or resigned to fight to the death strained the attackers to their limit and beyond. The horrendous weather alone would have been enough to cause some battle fatigue. Tough young bodies that could have coped for six or seven days with the extremely abnormal demands succumbed after weeks, in some cases months, of cumulative misery and exertion, adding nervous breakdown to fever, pneumonia, malaria, and a range of respiratory infections from the exposure. Combat's additional demands hugely augmented the strain, and the tension couldn't be dissipated, because units pulled back the usual 200 yards or so remained under artillery fire. Even L-Day had been too much for a scattering of Americans, including a few in the boats who remembered the blood of earlier landings. But most who came apart did so after combat's chaos and dread, where death was as fantastically near as a man inches away, or that man, usually a buddy, was disintegrated by a shell. Such gut-wrenching sights were often the straw that broke the backs of their nerves. Well after the war, the American army conceded that as many as one in ten of its soldiers suffered battle fatigue. Psychologists had learned that the number of shell shock or battle fatigue casualties increased in geometric proportion to the intensity of incoming fire and the length of exposure to it, which, again, is what distinguished Okinawa from previous campaigns. The report, Principal Lessons Learned in the Okinawa Operation, would stipulate that Troops should not remain in the front lines for more than two weeks, 
The first great concentration of enemy firepower at Kakazu Ridge produced the first surge of walking dead, for which the 10th Army soon had to allocate an entire field hospital. The evacuation of battle-hardened veterans of earlier island campaigns confirmed that longer pounding from Okinawa's more elaborate fortifications caused higher levels of strain. Sugarloaf claimed no fewer than 1,289 shell-shocked marines, almost half as many as the killed and wounded. The campaign cost the 10th Army as a whole almost 26,000 non-battle casualties, most psychiatric. An extraordinary 14,000 occurred at the Shuri Line, the heaviest concentration of incoming fire predictably producing the highest rate. The resilience of youth no doubt kept those numbers from being even higher. Roughly 80% of the Marine troops were under 21. Some sufferers babbled incoherently or suddenly leaped up and tried to charge a machine gun nest of Japanese who had been decimating their units. Others trembled, sobbed or wet their trousers. A few screamed weirdly, fought wildly and had to be restrained by their fellows, sometimes with fists. That happened to the most hardened, admired veteran officers and to some of the bravest men who had performed the most valorous feats here or on previous islands. Their buddies recognised they'd reached the breaking point, but most battle fatigue cases simply stopped functioning as fighters, a condition the others also recognised and led them to help in a battalion aid station. Their glazed eyes, slowed movements and witless expressions announced their nervous systems could absorb no more. They didn't care any longer. Over 2,500 would be discharged, many to remain more or less detached from reality and civilian life. Sometimes doctors and corpsmen designated the exhausted as blast concussion cases to get them off the line for rest before they cracked. But breakdowns also came later. One ammunition carrier in a machine gun squad became its leader after all the others had been killed and wounded, mostly one by one. In the end, he'd be the only man in his squad to have lasted the entire campaign. Despite the tremendous pressure of its 82 days, he remained cool, full of combat wisdom, and very helpful to replacements, many of whom took him for 25 years old, not his actual 19, straight through to the end. His toughness and savvy saved me, one would remember. His skill and leadership held us all together, until he was back on Guam, where he cracked during preparations for the invasion of the Japanese mainland. The last thing I remember about him was carrying him out of his tent on all fours. Fear caused most of the battle fatigue. It was so pervasive and its causes so obvious that discussing it would be superfluous if not for the combat literature and dramatisation, the kind on which most Marines like Whittaker had been raised, that failed to mention it. Veterans looking back from the perspective of 40-plus years, and with the candour prompted by the approach of their natural deaths, rarely hide the terror that squeezed their throats and stomachs. Fear gripped even when the most gallant deeds were being done. That was inevitable, since there could be no gallantry without it. We were all out there afraid, and the fear bound us together, a company commander would observe. No minute of any day was entirely free of it. You get scared, you remain scared, Whitaker would remember. Anyone who isn't is lying or a fool. It's terrifying, and you learn to live with it. Whitaker's company commander never retired even to battalion headquarters during his months of fighting, and remained scared. There's no way a man can prepare for the horror of advancing into an area where an enemy he can't see may end his life any second. No one grows up expecting to face that stark terror. It's beyond description. No notice was taken of messed pants, especially under artillery bombardment. Whittaker's first taste of that came the night after he was delivered from the north to the south, where his platoon hadn't had time to dig in well. He later guessed the Japanese had learned that the Marines were relieving the Army's 27th Division and wanted to rattle them, which they did, with a barrage that became accurate and furious in minutes. Unless stymied by coral, Marines liked to dig their holes about 18 inches deep and just wide enough for two bodies. When there was time, they'd dig deeper pockets at the four corners into which enemy hand grenades could be kicked before they exploded. That first night in the south, Whitaker and others had to use the 27th Division's foxholes, 
whose greater width left them feeling miserably exposed. Protection was further reduced by the low-trajectory Japanese fire that caused some shells to bounce off the ground and detonate in the air. Two men in Whittaker's company were blown to bits. The others huddled for much of the night in dismay and terror. Prolonged shelling is the hardest trial for most men in combat. Again, the Shuri line, with its greater concentration of Japanese heavy guns in greater variety than in any earlier Pacific campaign, made it harder than on other islands. That the Japanese endured far worse doesn't diminish the American ordeal. The 32nd Army's heavy artillery had only a thousand rounds of ammunition per barrel to expend, and their operation was further restricted by what the Americans would have considered woeful communications and coordination. But the big guns were commanded by one of Japan's most respected artillerists, General Kosuke Wada. From field officers to new replacements, Americans were awed and shaken by Japanese skill in zeroing in on them. Heavy shells would land 40 yards away, then 30, then closer, until, as an army doctor described it, they found a neighbouring foxhole and spilled the brains of a man's buddy all over him. Sledge found the whistle and scream of the big steel package of destruction almost unendurable. Bombardment was an invention of hell, the essence of man's inhumanity to man. I often had to restrain myself and fight back a wild, inexorable urge to scream, to sob and to cry, with terror and desperation. To Private Gilbert Cantor, the pounding on the way to Sugarloaf was beyond the imagination of anyone who hasn't experienced it. I was still in a supposedly safe place, but my body was shaking. I had only four days of fighting, but that was enough. It was too terrible. I looked up and saw some birds, miraculously, alive in that insanity, and even chirping. I wondered which of us was really the intelligent species. Cantor's fear would go up a notch even from there after his wounding in the throat near Sugarloaf's crest. After I was hit, I wanted to hide, to duck every time a plane went overhead. I was terrified. The pilot Samuel Hines identified two kinds of fear of shelling. The first, constant and inescapable, even in the relatively secure rear, was of not knowing the moment when a shell with your name on it would land, the unrelenting subliminal fear that, soon now, right now, as you cross the road, exposed and helpless, the shriek would sound and the shell would fall, carrying your death. But that was mild compared to the periods of tactical bombardment, when the bravest men couldn't stop trembling. Far as he was from the concentrated Japanese barrages at the front, Hines in his tent at Yomitan Airfield nevertheless felt pure terror. The ear-splitting pandemonium alone was unbearable. The approach of heavy shells that could be heard from a far distance prolonged unholy suspense. Battle-hardened men came to feel that the whistle alone could achieve the enemy's goal. The inability to do anything to save oneself was probably the most intolerable feature. A Navajo named Mike Kiani was in a foxhole near Sugar Loaf when a bombardment began from nearby Shuri. He'd seen the results before, much uglier wounds than those made by bullets. Now screams sounded as the shells advanced toward him. Then a friend was blown out of his foxhole ten feet away. Kiani didn't realise he too was hit, only that his friend was dying, and he was impotent. If you'd get up and run you'd be shot up even quicker, so you wait there and go crazy. Even the shells that missed shook the ground, shocking the ears and brain and sending hot fragments through the air, sometimes with body pieces. The young marine who shot himself in the toe did so after a dazzlingly accurate barrage of Japanese 150mm guns had landed a hit on a nearby foxhole, blowing its two cowering occupants into little red chunks. Some men, including a few who'd performed the bravest exploits during firefights when they could shoot back, were driven over the edge of sanity. During its eight weeks in the south, Whittaker's company was pulled back half a dozen times to several hundred yards from the front. Since Japanese snipers could be accurate at 500 yards and more, constant checking of the surroundings became second nature. Still, life at that distance from the edge was tolerable by comparison, except when the company took fire from artillery, boosting their fear to another pitch. 
A final trial for the Americans surpassed the others. For all its repetition, darkness never became easier to endure. The infantrymen who managed to stay unhit and unevacuated the full 82 days of the campaign dug some 70 foxholes as they advanced. They occasionally stayed two nights in the same hole or spent one in a tomb or the ruins of an Okinawan house. Otherwise, no one had to order them to dig. No sane man would spend a night on the surface. The units tried to set up by late afternoon. Each company's three infantry platoons spread out, giving the machine gun squad a favoured position and a bit more protection on the highest ground. In the marine divisions, the poor son of a bitch who operated the backpack radio was often a Navajo, like Mike Kiaani, who communicated with tribesmen in his native language with code words that were as unintelligible as the best coding devices to anyone outside the Navajo culture. That was to foil the significant number of Japanese who understood English. Each marine division had eight to ten Navajo, most so tough that they'd taken boot camp in stride. They worked in teams, switching from the hull's designated company command points to stations farther in the field. Their bravery impressed other marines. Radio operators could hide their antennas under their arms when moving during daylight, but had to extend them at night, a magnet for sniper fire. A manual issued to each conscripted Japanese jeered that Westerners, being very cowardly and effeminate, have an intense dislike of fighting in rain, mist or darkness. They can't conceive of night as a proper time for war. In this, if we seize upon it, lies our great opportunity. The Japanese indeed made excellent use of night attacks throughout the war. The 32nd Army in particular speculated that the enemy's great advantages in numbers and equipment made him overconfident, and noticing less discipline than their own in such duties as watch-standing, they sought to take advantage of the lapses when the enemy closed up shop each evening. U.S. Army post-mortem operations reports, such as the one that concluded most troops lacked confidence in their ability to accomplish night missions efficiently, would tend to validate Japanese sneers at Americans for fighting like office workers. But night excursions soon became more a necessity than an opportunity. Since leaving their caves for close combat, the only kind in which they stood a chance, was usually foolhardy during daylight, Japanese soldiers were all but forced to fight in the dark. They still heard pep talks about how effective Kirikomi, penetrating the enemy for hand-to-hand -hand combat, had been in previous battles, but current observation told them the contrary. They knew they'd be likely to set off torrential firing on themselves by touching the tripwire Americans rigged around the perimeter of their night positions. Still, they attacked as ordered, sometimes with enthusiasm, feeling they had to try something after hiding in their caves all day, more often with resignation, because night attacks became synonymous with suicide attacks, as one man noted. I'm sorry an officer told him on the eve of an outing. But resign yourself to being slain. When the time came, the selected men crept from their caves with as many grenades as they could tie around their waists and sometimes 22-pound explosive charges on their backs. Another soldier who watched such parties leave night after night saw them begin to take their deaths for granted, accepting their fate of summer bugs that fly into the fire and burn themselves. The Japanese kept a finger raised as they crawled toward American positions. When able to detect the protective wire without setting off the trip flares, they straddled the wire, got in closer, and used their grenades and satchel charges, or bayonets and knives. Few of their American targets stopped to think that the enemy's preference for night came chiefly from a need to avoid their own devastating firepower. Most thought operating in the dark, where men were certain to make mistakes and kill themselves, was a stupid way of fighting that confirmed the low-life Japanese as bloodthirsty fanatics. Their motivation mattered as little to American infantrymen as the ideals of kamikaze pilots mattered to American sailors. All they had to know was that the sneaks liked to do their slaying at night, so you stayed in your hole, waiting and hoping. You had a better chance if you didn't make a mistake. But even the sharpest eyes often couldn't see the killers coming. Each foxhole seemed to its pair of occupants a lone sanctuary. The other body pressed up against theirs contained the only friendly soul in a demented universe. 
It didn't have to belong to a buddy with whom they spent free time. The Corps forged transferable trust. It was enough that he was a Marine and had come that far, and therefore served as a link, the only one, to hope in the madness of the tyrannically malevolent dark. The watch-standing norm was four hours on, four off. The general practice was to stay awake as long as you could, then wake your mate, who stayed awake as long as he could. They strained to interpret every sound out there, strained to see, often through heavy rain, the cleverly camouflaged killers before they struck. It was like a game of hide-and-seek, one Marine would recall, except with the ultimate stakes. The Japanese knew the terrain better. Especially at night, they knew where you were, but you could only guess about them. What you did know was that they'd spend hours stalking you with infinite patience. Some crawled to within inches without being heard, sometimes all the way, despite your precaution. In those cases, the percentage of deaths was high, and the wounds grievous, because many were inflicted from directly above the foxhole or actually in it. The difficulty of wielding rifles there led to a great demand for .45 pistols. When Whittaker managed to obtain one, he slept with it in his hand or tucked into his belt. Despite a fear of shooting my balls off while half asleep, he always kept a round in the chamber, the hammer half cocked and the thumb safety off. On the second night after the landing, an infiltrator's grenade exploded between two of Melvin Hecht's platoon mates in a hole six feet away and killed both instantly. Several nights later, a Japanese team sneaked up on a foxhole of Captain Stebbins's G222 company. A pair in another hole mere yards away heard nothing until one of the attackers had crawled almost on top of his target with a satchel charge. The waiting for them to repeat that on every night hearing the noises, feeling the tension, every night. An infiltrator crept up unheard to the hole of a Marine from Chicago named Ray Eustace during the night of May 12th, 13. His bayonet entered the back of Eustace's neck, pierced his throat, sliced down through his chest and one lung, and exited at the armpit. Few infantrymen failed to see such casualties with their own eyes, within ten or twenty yards. Paul Gibson set a trip flare in the bottom of a drainage ditch into which Japanese had crawled on previous nights before lobbing grenades into his platoon's foxholes. Gibson heard his trap go off in the middle of the night, but no flare went up. In the morning, he found it lodged in a Japanese throat, so the watchstanders had reason to sense hideous death in the thousand countryside sounds they heard or imagined. Drenched with cold rain, those off-watch shivered in muddy puddles, and not only muddy, for if sanitation was bad during the day, it was worse at night, when few were crazy enough to leave their holes for anything. Nor did dysentery's effects abate after dark, and on any given night, a number of the men were also vomiting from stress and ordinary sickness. Many were reluctant to bail slop from their holes for fear of the noise. Even with a good poncho, even after the hardest day's fighting, most found sound sleep almost impossible until their exhaustion approached infirmity. The buddies of 18-year-old Declan Klingenhagen thought him dead because he slept through one night's long, fierce mortar barrage without moving a muscle. Merely maintaining mental equilibrium in the mire was an ordeal. Whittaker never found a comfortable position for weeks on end. Men also worried about deadly snakes slithering into their foxholes. Besides, although each one knew he could count on his foxhole mate, some watchstanders did doze off. However great their exhaustion, the off-watchers rarely got more than snatches of sleep. On many nights, neighbouring foxholes more than an arm's length away might as well have been on the next planet, in Whittaker's image. You can't be absolutely certain they're not asleep over there. You can't communicate with them anyway because a whisper can get you shot. There was a special fear of being cut off from one's unit and left alone with Japanese brutality, but even greater fear of giving away one's position. Everyone knew a whisper travelled like a bugle at night. Platoon leaders had wider communications. Fine black wires were strung from their radios to the hole that served as the company command point. Every half hour or so, an operator there checked the other positions, blowing into his microphone as softly as he could and murmuring, First Platoon. The acknowledgement was even fainter, the barest trace of a whisper. First Platoon.
then second and third platoons. But those slightest possible sounds were sometimes enough to attract a bullet in the hand or face of the communicator at either end. After one man Whittaker called answered in his whisper, Dick heard the instant high-pitched chatter of a Nambu machine gun. Then, over the wires, the operator's muffled moan. An unanswered call might mean the man on the other end had heard something and was afraid to give away his position, but it was usually treated as evidence of enemy penetration. In that case, the company commander sent a man out to inch toward the silent platoon, using the wire as a lead. That man knew Japanese soldiers might have the same wire in their hands while crawling toward him from out there in the blackness. When Whittaker was dispatched on the terrifying mission one night, he was only yards out of his hole in the direction of the mute platoon when heavy fire suddenly broke out there. He realised the man hadn't answered because the infiltrators had crept so close that a whisper would have sealed his doom. Although Whittaker now had all the psychological defences necessary to live as a combat animal, they didn't ease the dark hours for him. The quiet out there, so much more terrifying than any horror movie score. You're so lonely, so isolated. The world consists of you and your foxhole buddy. He's the only other human being in the world, the only thing you have to keep you sane. One evening, two of his hardened buddies gouged out their hole several yards forward of the line, in a kind of point position. One was killed during the night, and the other had to spend the rest of it alone. At dawn, he was confirmation of the general rule that to feel alone in combat is to cease to function. It is the terrifying prelude to the final loneliness of death. Whittaker helped lead the incoherent man with the petrified eyes back to an aid station. You can't understand what night was like. To be in a foxhole and hear something in the pitch-black void was the most terrifying of all possible experiences. Nobody cared what they shot at out there as long as it stopped those terrifying noises. You got up in the morning and saw a collection of dead things where they were, from goats to rats to Japanese to civilian children. That too was terrible, but there was no way to tell what was coming at you hours before. Infiltrators often used a noisy movement or quick burst of their own fire as a lure to locate enemy positions, which was why Americans were instructed to hold their nighttime fire except when absolutely necessary. But terrified of everything that moved, as one put it, we fired at everything. Somebody fires at a rattle of leaves, another explained, and when one person fires, everybody fires. The jittery fusillades swelled the number of own fire casualties because the tendency was to shoot anybody on his feet first and then inquire. You just couldn't distinguish friend and foe in the split seconds you had. Kenny Guyman's closest call came when a clank of metal against a helmet woke him. Enemy grenades had to be armed with such a tap after their pins had been pulled, and he saw Japanese eyes staring at him. Screaming, he rolled out of his hole into some brush. The screams set off a volley from neighbouring holes, and Gaiman was saved, but he'd forgotten the night's password and had to spend its remaining hours in the brush, motionless except for his quivering. In the morning, sixteen bullets were counted in the Japanese corpse. Gaiman knew he too would have been shot to pieces at the first sound he made. When they had time, Americans rigged their wires around the perimeter of their clustered foxholes, the wires Japanese tried to detect by crawling with a raised finger, then strung them with trip flares and pebble-stocked tin cans. A machine gun set up to fire in a wide arc would blast everything at the first sound of pebbles dancing in the can, indicating the wire had been touched. The trip flare, a thing of beauty, because... It was like having someone else on watch in addition to your foxhole buddy. Provided slight reassurance against dreaded surprise. It would freeze the infiltrator for a few seconds, long enough for an accurate rifle shot. Few nights went without incident. One marine put the average number of crawlers at half a dozen, lots female, who may or may not have been just natives trying to survive. Platoon leader Mitchell Zampikos spotted a tiny mound near his hole one daybreak after a night during which he kept hearing faint noises but could see nothing. Soon he saw movement inside and was certain a small animal was about to emerge. Zampikos ordered his men to hold their fire, then watched an elderly Okinawan woman pull herself out. 
What a sight! She really did live like an animal all night in that tiny hole and in that rain. But the Americans had to assume crawlers were trying to sneak in for kills. They could also use walkie-talkies to call for larger flares from the mortar section. These were relatively less dangerous when foxholes had been dug without tell-tale mounds of earth around the rim to reveal their positions. That's why mortar gunners loathed firing flare shells. A trail of flame from the tubes revealed their positions. Soon an amazing luminescence was in the air, lighting everything. Everything included oneself. Whitaker felt flares were like a thousand searchlights thrown on you. They also lit up sheets of slanting rain and scatterings of corpses. The phosphorus light, stark but greenish, garish yet ghostly, was a final eerie touch. Hallucinations were frequent, given the macabre setting and exhausted men. Sledge saw dead marines rise from waterlogged craters and try to tell him something. Floating down in its parachute, the freakish light nevertheless seemed to stay up forever, an eternity. The blackened tree stumps, disabled field guns and burned-out tanks seemed to confirm that some great natural calamity had recently destroyed the area. The dreaded infiltrators were also usually there, running, dodging and ducking for cover at almost every flare. Always out there, Whitaker specified, always on their way to penetrate us. Japanese flares seemed to hang in the air terrifying minutes longer. In either case, Marines froze. The slightest movement in the light would make them targets. But Japanese soldiers also knew to freeze and often passed for corpses. Flares could work as well for the other side, and although it was really nice to catch a dozen Japanese out there, the advantage was reversed when a well-prepared enemy had time to see where to toss a grenade before he could be shot. While all hated the darkness, they hated that unearthly light too. And although the nights grew shorter in May and June, each additional ordeal seemed to last longer than the previous ones. Men bolted up from their semi-sleep, saw their buddies peering out for the menaces, and closed their eyes again but couldn't shake their fear. I lived through some days nobody would believe. The blood, the filth, the deaths, but the nights were worse. You can't see what's out there and you don't know anything except that you can die any minute. The suspense is fantastic. Tropical sunsets are beautiful, right? But when you knew what was coming, you hated them, hated them. From sunset to daybreak, nobody moved. You just waited for dawn, couldn't wait for it, your heart pounding, your finger on the trigger. You never got used to it. Know what I mean by looking forward to the kinds of days we were having? But at least you could see during the day. It didn't have that constant terror. Whitaker's worst night after his first artillery bombardment in the south took place on the Oroku Peninsula, which his regiment invaded by amphibious landing two weeks after Sugarloaf. With his company taking heavy sniper fire as evening approached, he and his mate, John Centerfit, with whom he'd come down from Sugarloaf, had to scrape a hurried foxhole alongside the shoulder of a dirt road at the bottom of a hill. The moonless night was pitch black. Other foxholes were only yards away, but that was too far for communication, and the other men probably couldn't hear the careful sounds on the narrow road. But Whitaker and Centerfit heard them, whisperings and tiny noises of concealed movement that suggested the Japanese were massing for a banzai attack. Convinced they'd be shot if they called for mortars or a flare, they tried not to move a single muscle so as not to give themselves away to whoever was making those preparations, mere yards away. A night of horrors isn't just a saying, there is such a thing. You never got used to it. Evan Regal had hated his Paris Island drill instructor so passionately that he swore to kill him, I mean kill the sadistic guy, if he ever managed to see him in combat. After the D.I. became one of the stateside marines corralled to replace the unexpected casualties on Okinawa, Regal did see his torturer, and thanked him for saving his life, again and again, by teaching me right. Because Okinawa was so much worse than the worst day of boot camp that there was no way to guess until you were there. You won't believe either if I tell you. You have no way to understand, like I didn't. Yet profound satisfactions partially compensated Regal and almost all other Americans for their torment. 
For all but the handful who enjoyed killing, some of the reward came from the exhilaration of having survived a trip to the far edge of human experience. When Dick Whitaker would think of Sugar Loaf years and decades later, he'd feel great pride, mixed with some well-deserved conceit, in having been among the few who fought on the cursed hill. The one trip up, the charge from his fifteen minutes of terrified bedlam there, gave enough to last a lifetime. Just to know I did it is enough. Okinawa's hundred other battles endowed almost all survivors, apart from those who would never recover from battle fatigue with a similar reserve of self-esteem. The best thing that ever happened to me. Nothing can ever dim what we did there. The proudest moments of my life. Everyone who saw actual combat cherishes lifelong memories, terrible but also sublime. Naturally, that pertains far more to American participants than to Japanese, most of whom would be ashamed of having survived. Even without their obligation to die rather than surrender, surviving on the losing side was emotionally very different. Very few Japanese who did would share the American gratitude for the experience. The netherworld of combat offered other rewards. Living on the edge afforded a heady freedom from many of civilization's restraints, an intoxicating sensation for most young men. That made them high when not driving them low with fear and misery. Combat's supreme intensity dominates everything, cutting away all unrelated problems. It delivers its participants to hell on earth, but simultaneously to utopia, which largely explains why thoughtful, loving men can love war even while knowing and hating it, as William Broyles recently wrote. In World War II, as never later, righteousness strengthened the impulses feeding that love. Most Americans on Okinawa drew great satisfaction from fighting for God, democracy, and what they felt was an ultimate goodness. Utterly secure in their conviction that victory was vital to civilization, they were sustained by moral purpose, even amid the filth and torment. When Emil Ruchinsky, a gunnery sergeant turned platoon leader, was gravely wounded on May 11th, he was given absolution as he requested. On his first stretcher, he supposed he wouldn't make it, but the thought didn't depress him. I had some morphine in me by then, but I think I was at peace with the idea anyway, because I had a patriotic conviction, remember that? I was doing something important for my country, so I took it as an honour if I was going to die. Forrest Townsend was uneasy because he, a replacement, hardly knew anyone in his new squad, and he was scared to death by the intensifying artillery fire as it pushed south with its company. You just can't live through those shells raining down on you without fear. Still, Townsend knew he was doing what had to be done, surrounded by the world's best fighting men. On a late May morning, his squad had to cross an open field on its way to levelled Naha. Two men made it to cover on the far side, but an enemy soldier popped up from a hole in the ground when Townsend was halfway across, and a burst from his Nambu machine gun spun Townsend around and down. An inner voice had time to comment that that was the way it was when you were hit, even as training and instinct issued commands. Find cover fast, any cover. Don't let him finish you off. He slid into a shell hole and was shocked again by rainwater rising to his waist his bleeding chest, his armpits. The eighteen-year-old knew he'd been hit very badly. Am I going to die here? Well, mother wouldn't want it, but she and dad will be proud of me. Very sad, but also very proud, the whole family, so it's okay. Tens of thousands took similar comfort. A corps man in a surgical tent tended a parade of casualties, whose fierce pain seemed not to faze them, whose composure, the product of their pride and sense of reward, helped many recover. Whatever their individual resources, the corpsman would conclude, all of them had a fantastic support system. They had constant nurturing, at least rhetorical, not only from their comrades, but also their families, communities, government, all of society. America had only one face, and that face told them they were on God's side, fighting the good fight. No one questioned the rights and wrongs because all knew they were right. Therefore, no one really questioned the need for the suffering. But Americans' uplift from fighting for the highest national cause usually remained in the background, 
In the foreground was a handful of beloved comrades. Another combat reward was a love as difficult for outsiders to know as the horrors that sired it. The love fed on trust. Unlike that of ordinary friendship and romantic attachment, this one was total, since one's life was constantly in the hands of one's platoon mates. The bond could not be broken by a word, by boredom or divorce, or by anything other than death, as Philip Caputo would write. Ordinary life's usual mean motives and jockeying for personal advantage vanished in the mutual reliance on and concern for one's fellows. Those who endured the grime and gore together felt themselves elevated toward absolute selflessness. Thus, all combat offered some of the kamikaze pilots exhilaration at being liberated from petty considerations. It compelled but also freed men to act more unselfishly, lovingly and nobly than they ever had or would. The intensity of their devotion was comparable only to the surge parents feel for their young children when they're endangered. But here the emotion was reciprocated, prompting an intoxicating gratification. Class position and social origins counted for nothing in the world of instant death and ubiquitous maggots. Marines in particular were Marines, not members of other groups. It was all the same who you were and where you came from because you were the same, struggling with higher forces. Blacks remained the exception. Still not acknowledged as the same on Okinawa, they served in segregated army units, some fighting, a majority in support services such as transportation and laundry, and nowhere at all in the Marines, apart from a scattering of orderlies. But Okinawa would break down even some of those barriers, as in a marine medical unit that returned to Guam in July, after the campaign, and was led to a common mess until it could set up its own. Base personnel directed a handful of black stewards who'd served in the officers' mess on Okinawa to a separate, segregated table, but those officers refused to eat there under those arrangements. Because when the fighting got furious, a white corpsman would remember, those stewards also served as litter-bearers under fire, if they were good enough to be shot at with the rest of us, they were good enough to eat with us. That's what we learned, including our large sprinkling of southern rednecks, and we prevailed in the end. The Navajo who served as communications specialists tended to seek their own company when not on the line. Many years later, after Dick Whitaker had learned about racial minorities' sensitivities, he'd regret having called them all chief without a thought but that practice was grounded more in innocent ignorance than prejudice. There was little overt discrimination against, and much affection for, the Indians, those buddies under fire. As for Jews, some had encountered coarse anti-Semitism during their training, and on their troop ships coming over, even occasionally in some rear areas on the island itself. In the strain and compensatory unit embrace of combat itself, However, ethnic and religious antagonism evaporated, and when pulled back into temporary reserve, men of all faiths almost indiscriminately attended services held by Catholic, Protestant and Jewish chaplains. Even the atheists prayed, one man would remember with only marginal exaggeration. Infantryman Gilbert Cantor, who'd be shot in the throat near Sugarloaf's Crest six weeks later, was surprised that a man he'd splattered with his vomit as they approached the shore in their L-Day landing craft never said a thing, not even you dirty man. From then on, there was no hint of anti-Semitism. We were like one. Jews were such a small percentage of the Marines on Okinawa that some companies had none, although one Jewish platoon leader carried a little black book, evidently the Kaddish, and asked some of his men to read a few paragraphs in case he was badly hit. About an hour later, one of his men inched to his officer's corpse in order to fulfil the request. Battle makes brothers of men who had previously had very little in common, and their intimacy and love are not quite understandable to people outside the family. Even for men like Whitaker, whose home lives had lacked nothing in affection, their combat family of total partnership and interdependence brought more intense commitment than anything in civilian life. Returning after the war to peacetime's individual strivings, the brothers would go their divergent ways, departing more and more from what had been the common interests of unformed teenagers in uniform. Still, when marine veterans of Okinawa would meet at reunions half a century later, 
Their durable love filled the vapid motel banquet rooms, the fierce male tenderness that men feel for flesh and blood in war, as Lawrence Vanderpost called it, remained almost palpable. Vanderpost likened the bond of devotion to fire. It spread over Okinawa together with the devastation, no hotter than on other Pacific islands, but igniting more souls in the war's largest, most difficult campaign. Each man fought to keep his inner group alive. Letting one down would haunt him forever. That, too, was different for the Japanese. Their courage had to be greater than the Americans, if only because they faced so much more firepower in encounters made more deadly by it, and with little rest, no replacements, and they couldn't even hope to keep their buddies alive. Brotherhood was harder to sustain in units that were disintegrating, as many Japanese units soon would be. For a people who view themselves primarily as members of a group, that calamity was especially demoralising. The ultimate loneliness of being cut off from one's fellows was even more frightening for Japanese than Americans. Still, many units did hold together as they were being destroyed, engendering a multitude of kindnesses that would never be recorded because every man in many units died. When one of Captain Kojo's companies faced what promised to be total annihilation, a group of friends dug a hole outside their cave to make red bean soup, a delicacy. The fire under the pot had to be minuscule lest the approaching enemy see it and finish them there and then. The very old beans remained stone hard even after a long period of anxious boiling. American mortars were landing within yards of the tent by the time the treat was finally rushed inside the cave. Each of some thirty men slowly licked his cup of it, savouring its sweet taste. No one said as much, but we all knew this was our farewell party. Japanese soldiers expressed some of their fierce male tenderness in attempts to respect the dead, a large number of whom, however, could not be buried. Incoming fire made it impossible to recover most bodies, a more difficult task for the retreating side in any case, because the dead often lay in enemy territory. Still, thousands of Japanese took huge risks to bury friends. Battlefield camaraderie, sealed perhaps by a higher degree of love while there was little hope of anything but joining those bodies, was many units only joy. Kuniichi Izuchi, the artist whose gruelling apprenticeship to the master had made basic training seem easy, almost missed the Okinawan ordeal. He was in an army hospital in Beijing, his leg gashed by a mortar, when he heard his unit was being transferred. He begged permission to join them and it was granted. Arriving with another surname, his original one, the passionate patriot developed a close friendship with a fellow soldier named Izuchi, who was killed soon after Elday. Kuniichi fought to find his body, then severed the left hand and found some wood to cremate it. The two had promised each other that whoever survived longer would bring some of the other's bones to his family. But when Kuniichi too was very badly hit and dragged himself around for days without help, he became so weak that Izuchi's few bones were nearly more than he could carry. Still, his promise remained sacred, even when he came a breath from death. When he returned to Japan in 1946, he presented the bones to Izuchi's family, and took Izuchi's sister's surname when he married her the following year, a fairly common practice when the bride's family lacked a male heir. But although Japanese soldiers performed 10,000 such acts of heroic devotion to their buddies and their memory, the losers in the battles also lost some of the sense of compensation for their misery. Their veterans' reunions are much more sombre and spiritual than the victors. Every Marine still loved the Corps, with its honourable bloodline and heroic ancestors, now his own. Each still believed he was part of the best damn fighting outfit in the world. But thoughts about that extended family dwindled. When the going got toughest for the 6th Marine Division in mid-May, as it had been tough for army units since early April, most men in the line came to feel they were fighting not for the Corps, let alone for God or democracy, but for the handful of fellows at their side. My world was the ten guys in my squad, Edward Buzzy Fox would remember. The squad was down to ten because replacements for their casualties were unavailable and maybe my company to some extent. To tell the truth, I didn't really care about anything else. There just wasn't enough strength or imagination 
Whitaker would reflect that generals perceived the world as masses of men and equipment, captains as deployments of companies, sergeants as movements of platoons. The ordinary Joes, like himself, had all they could do to cope with the welfare of their own fire teams of five or six men. Stripped of their privacy and social skins, that half-dozen fought, slept and performed all natural functions, as well as battles unnatural ones, in total togetherness. Fire teams now lived more like wolf litters than human brothers. Their ages drew them further together. We were physically tough, really, truly tough, 18-year-old Walter Kaminsky quickly discovered. But inside we were just teenagers who needed our families. And the guys in your unit were the only family you had, and maybe the last you'd ever see. Kaminsky, who'd grown up in a close Chicago family, needed that support as much as anyone. Wounded the day before the start on Sugar Loaf, gregarious young Kaminsky made his way back about a mile to the tent of a field hospital. Without his platoon brothers there, he was suddenly a vulnerable teenager alone in the alien world, feeling cut off from everything, even his beloved core. His depression threatened to disable him longer than his wrist wound, until a priest named Eugene Kelly saw it during his rounds to comfort patients. What's your name, son? Kaminsky, father. No, your first name. Walt. Hey, Walt. Two guys were looking for you just before we started talking. They went out there. Knowing the visitors could only be his buddies, Kaminsky leapt up and continued feeling better even after other patients near where Kelly pointed said they'd seen no two guys. Later, he lovingly called him the lying priest. But if there ever was a good lie, that was it. He snapped me out of my stupor because he knew what buddies mean to a combat rifleman, something different from anything else in the world. Human virtue fell short of perfection even there. Congenital braggarts, cowards and hoodlums didn't change much. A sprinkling of thieves stripped bodies of their wristwatches because the grave digger will get this stuff otherwise, and I know he'd rather it went to me. But the few rotten apples didn't spoil the barrel. Thousands of wounded Kaminskys and Whitakers hurried back to the front as fast as they could, even lying to their doctors to do so, instead of staying a deserved extra day or week under care. Lots of men with bad wounds begged to be patched up and sent back to their units, Corpman Bangert would remember. Unfortunately, we had some of the most patriotic boys in the world, but mainly they couldn't bear the thought of their buddies still in danger out there. That's what drew them back to combat even after they'd lived with its unbelievable awfulness. Of course everyone wanted to go home. At the same time, many wanted to continue sharing their buddy's burden, even knowing it would probably end in grave wounds or death. Such loyalty helps explain their obsession with recovering their dead, which was driven by more than respect for the remains. Every Marine's resolve to honour a slain buddy's memory and reputation made an unrecovered body deprived of its proper treatment, the worst possible loss. It was part of the bargain we all made, the reason we were too willing to die for one another, Michael Norman recently wrote of the same commitment in Vietnam. Men crawled into the killing zone because each believed that if his had been the body, other Marines would have come for him. A man who performed many recoveries on Okinawa specified that it was essential not for the corpses but for the living, who could count on a decent burial, just like he would count on his buddies never letting him down in any hell. Some tried to sustain the emotional ecstasy even from back in the States. A secret part of them had dreamed of a million-dollar wound, serious enough to make them unfit for combat, but not for civilian life. After Sugarloaf, however, a few who were back home with that lucky degree of damage, and who felt alienated from everyone who hadn't been in on the edge with them, began writing their buddies about rejoining them. Only the glow of the purest manly selflessness could lure them back to the madness of shock and fatigue. Two weeks after the end on Sugarloaf, William Manchester was in the courtyard of a tomb with a man named Rip Thorpe. They heard the shriek of an approaching, screaming Mimi Mortar, but the chances seemed remote that the huge shell could clear the top of the hill and land on its safer back slope where the tomb was located but this one fell into its courtyard, and Thorpe's disintegrating body sent fragments of bone into Manchester. 
his flesh, blood, brains and intestines encompassed me. Most infantrymen who fought a week or two on Okinawa had that same supreme shock and horror, seeing a combat friend instantaneously destroyed inches away. If many wept openly when their buddies were killed out of their sight, the effect was predictably worse when cubs in the litter were dismembered or atomized in their sight, with the crunch and squish in their hearing. Two days after Sugar Loaf, a direct hit of an artillery shell killed a man who was covering others with his body. One buddy's grief spiralled further when the dead man was listed as missing in action because the chunks of leg and hip that could be found weren't enough to identify the corpse. A screeching shell passed no more than a foot over Eugene Sledge's head when he was sheltering in a foxhole on Half Moon Hill, then exploded two holes down where a man had been drinking hot chocolate. It also instantly killed the two youngsters in the hole next to his. Irving Oertel enjoyed a break in Naha's outskirts after fighting through its rubble. No one felt fully safe within a thousand yards of the front because nothing that close was reliably free of metal slicing the air. But in that area, believed to be pretty secure, Oertel and a mortarman named Prince were sitting on their helmets playing cards on an ammunition box. A single shot rang out. The bullet imploded Prince's head and he died before he could utter a sound. Although Oertel had seen a great deal of death, especially during his charge up Sugar Loaf weeks earlier, this was his time for the screws to come loose. Usually when someone was hit, you shouted once or twice for a corpsman and tried to stop the bleeding until he came. But this was too much, I guess. Although I didn't know it then, I kept screaming over and over for a corpsman, even though nothing could help my friend Prince. Few infantrymen were spared splattering by their friend's blood and tissues. Ed Jones, known as Teeth because he smiled so much, saw a man catch a bullet full in the face, also south of Naha. His whole mouth was simply gone. It was just terrible. I wasn't so good at forgetting that. A month after Anthony Cortese saw the sea of dead marines on Sugarloaf from nearby Chocolate Drop Hill, his platoon again took heavy fire while advancing up another hill farther south. Its leader, a Green Lieutenant just arrived from the States, ordered him to scout the enemy positions with two other men. They started up the hill. A shell landed nearby, killing one of his young companions and blowing off the legs of the other. How can I forget that? He tried to pick himself up and couldn't believe what he saw. He had no legs. He died right there. How can I ever forget? Anyone not hit after a week or two had a horseshoe in his hip pocket as Robert Shearer, Whittaker's company commander, put it. Everyone remembered incidents of missing death by an instant, of a man taking a step away and, before his foot came down, seeing someone else killed in the spot he'd just vacated. But what invested the experience with too much emotion for normal nerves to bear was that the other man was likely to be a combat friend, loved more deeply than all but the luckiest lovers. Inches away, bullets and shells turned the dearest creatures on earth, the objects of their fierce male tenderness, into offal and ooze that stuck to their own helmets and faces. The shock and dismay, trauma and bereavement topped the general loss of much that distinguishes human beings from lower forms of life. Although so much savage death numbed combat infantrymen, few could jettison their moral sense entirely. They were further dehumanised by the bestial, monstrous and vile things they had to do. The sight of mutilated bodies alone was often enough. One 18-year-old saw a pair of nonchalant Japanese legs standing beside a low wall and the torso sliced off by an artillery shell on its other side. He laughed. But another part of him kept asking why he himself was still alive. Bullets surely intended for him had killed his buddies. He would continue asking why, 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 for 50 years. Sledge once saw a Japanese gunner sitting upright with his eyes wide open, although the top of his head had been shot off. A night of rain had filled the skull with water, into which a buddy of Sledge was flipping chunks of coral and watching the splashes like a child tossing pebbles into a puddle. It was so unreal. There was nothing malicious in his action. This was just a mild-mannered kid who was now a 20th-century savage. 
When heavy fire stopped Dick Whittaker's company near Sugar Loaf one day, his platoon leader called for help from a flamethrowing tank, one of America's most fearsome weapons, which saw its first major use on Okinawa. The tank moved up to shoot streams of napalm into the cave from which machine gun fire had been hitting Whittaker's platoon. Japanese soldiers who ran from the furnace were squirted with napalm, which, however, failed to ignite. One of the tankers saw to that with a tracer bullet, turning a fleeing man into a torch, which prompted a throaty cheer from the platoon. That was our war, Robert Shearer would remember. Yes, that Japanese had been machine-gunning our people moments before, but he was a human being, and we cheered that incredibly horrible sight, the burning of another human. Whatever the justification, we'd become savages too. Buzzy Fox registered the spiritual metamorphosis the day before he joined the line as a green replacement, when he saw a fellow marine testing his rifle on a cow. I think that's terrible, he said, but the shooter explained that the incessant rain and inescapable mud made it vital to test his M1. I still think killing an animal unnecessarily is stupid, until my time in foxholes, when I'd have been happy to test my rifle on a live animal if any more existed on the island. Civilised values may have been the ultimate loss. You can't ask a man who's been in combat how he feels about those things when he does them, reflected John Townsend, no relation to the forest Townsend who took comfort from his family's pride. If you want to know that, go to a slaughterhouse and ask the men there what they feel about their jobs. You're dealing in meat, not lives. I resigned from the human race. I just wanted to kill, another marine would recall. A very small percentage were sadists who enjoyed it, but most were ordinary American boys raised on the Ten Commandments. However, they'd relished the thought of zapping Japanese during their training. What they had to do in reality degraded them. Sledge knew no combat infantrymen would ever be the same. They weren't just living in conditions that taxed the toughest I knew almost to the point of screaming, but also contributing to depravity, an acceptance that human life was not at all sacred. 19. Kojo at the Shuri Line Tadashi Kojo's fighting began in late April, while the 6th Marine Division was still in the north and the five other American divisions, one Marine and four Army, were making their unacceptably slow progress against the main fortifications. Kojo joined the battle on the Shuri Line, just northeast of Shuri itself. To the participants, the four miles to Sugarloaf on the west might have been forty. The battles for the major strong points seemed like separate wars. Ushijima's other division, in addition to Kojo's 24th, was the 62nd. Lightly armed to begin with, it had borne the brunt of the defence, which drained half its fighting strength. No longer fearing a second major American landing in the Deep South, the commander now ordered the 24th's 22nd Regiment out of reserve to reinforce it. Kojo wasn't with Colonel Yoshida, the recently arrived regimental commander, when he established his field headquarters on a hill a mile behind his forward troops. Still recuperating as the regimental operations officer, he handled paperwork and attended Shuri briefings. With only his small operations staff to command, he nevertheless considered the tropical uniform insufficiently officer-like and dressed like Ushijima, in his regular uniform with breeches and a pith helmet. Actually, only the 22nd Regiment's 1st Battalion was available to respond to Ushijima's order, the other two having been detached earlier and severely mauled. On April 26, two days after that essentially Hale 1st Battalion was committed, a naval shell's direct hit on its headquarters killed its commander. Captain Kojo was ordered to replace that major, that is, to return to the unit that had been his before the accidental explosion that nearly finished him. Leaving his personal effects in the regimental tunnel south of Naha, he resumed command of the men he'd trained in Manchuria and led during their early months on Okinawa. They were now defending a long ridge behind the village of Kochi, a critical high point guarding Shuri and 32nd Army headquarters, some two miles behind them. They were attacked the following morning. After so much digging elsewhere, including the abandoned fortifications commanding the landing beaches, they'd here had time only for foxholes slightly forward of their caves.
Kojo's cave was a small one, fifty yards behind the main ridge, on the rear slope of another small rise. After nearly eight single-minded years girding for combat as a cadet and an officer, this would be his first engagement. The fastidious captain felt no fear. His confidence in General Ushijima and unvanquishable Japan remained absolute. He had the same confidence in his training, which is why it took him disastrously long, as he'd learn when it was almost too late, to correct his mistakes. Among American misconceptions about Japanese soldiers was the conviction that they were born jungle fighters. Combat veterans associated the absolutely atrocious, murderous climate of previous islands with the jungle rats, assuming, as one put it, that Nips lived from birth in that awful, miserable unhealthiness. Even the respected war correspondent John Hersey believed Japanese take to the jungle as if they had been bred there. The truth was that most were trained for quite different conditions and had to learn as painfully as any novice to adapt. The notion that they were natural defenders was equally misconceived. Kojo's constant training for offence had begun at the Imperial Military Academy, whose cadets were assured that a single-spirited Japanese division properly fired with dedication to all-out decisive attack could defeat three better-equipped Soviet ones. Professionally and emotionally, the army relegated defence to something almost unnecessary, if not actually shameful. Although the 24th Division was a partial exception because it had expected to face heavy Soviet armour, that didn't substitute for training. Kojo's occasional defensive exercises in Manchuria took place on paper, never in the field or with a belief they'd be needed. The reserve officers who now served as his company commanders knew even less about defence. Starting at Kochi with slightly less than his full complement of 1,100 men, Kojo instructed those company commanders to position them on the ridge's forward slope from where they could observe the American advance and rush out to meet it at opportune moments. They were in sight of a host of enemy warships anchored in a bay less than five miles away. That first day, naval guns joined American mortars and artillery in delivering what felt like a horizontal squall of shells. American fire was ten to twenty times heavier than the Japanese barrages that would decimate the marines at Sugarloaf and the other strong points. Kojo registered to himself that it was unbelievably more powerful than anything he'd expected, almost a new kind of warfare entirely. As on subsequent days, he saw little more because the barrage kept him in his cave until it let up at twilight, when he found a startling number of men had been killed without having fired a shot. At intervals, his weary survivors, eyes already bloodshot, would fire their machine guns and small arms at advancing Americans, who usually retreated. Moments later, however, enemy shells would burst above them, red lights flickering in their black smoke. Then the fragments rain down on us and we can't lift our heads. Hit that way day after thunderous day, soldiers at all the strong points like Kochi became convinced their sector had been selected for special fury. The ferocity of the bombing is terrific, a superior private recorded in his diary. What the hell kind of men are they? Bomb from six to six. Massive concentrations of additional artillery, heavy mortars and naval fire, a battleship or cruiser provided gunfire support for each American army regiment, reduced even some American troops to stupefaction or numbness, as one put it, before they advanced into the wreckage of earth where the explosives had landed. Just like Americans, Japanese were consumed with the frustration of being unable to do anything against the firing from long range. A private in Kojo's battalion would remember no dead angle or safe place anywhere. Bombs and shells came from land, from the sea, from the sky. If you were in a valley, trench mortars did the job. One step out of your cave and your fate was in God's hands. Another put it more directly. It's sheer wonder that any foot soldiers managed to live. The supremely professional Kojo was less concerned. So this is real combat, he said to himself. Very costly. But he didn't react to the cost, and his non-commissioned officers never dreamed of complaining. Reckoning the time must soon come for the bayonet charge for which the battalion had practised so long and ardently, he anticipated his chance to make the Americans panic as his predecessors had done to the Chinese in the Sino-Japanese War. 
What did such practice have to do with this war? What good were bayonets against flame-throwing tanks? But he'd ask himself that only after the war, when he at last fully accepted that firepower, in which deluded Japan was pathetically inferior, was the critical determinant. Meanwhile, he kept his men on the forward slopes, where they could see, and be seen by, American observers. Almost a week passed, and nearly half his men were lost before he woke up, in his own phrase. Now he ordered his company commanders to keep only one or two men from each platoon in the forward slope's foxholes. All others were to remain under cover on the rear slope until the enemy's big guns let up and his infantry approached. Although Japanese forces had deployed similarly on other islands, Kojo was so unpracticed in defence that he considered himself something of an originator when he at last put his new tactics into practice. Days later, his force of nearly a thousand had been reduced by about two-thirds. But now casualties were much diminished. His new deployment worked well. His attackers were the 17th Infantry Regiment of the Army's veteran 7th Hourglass Division, which had been in some of the bitterest fighting in the South from the first week in April. They'd move out every morning after their breakfast, sometimes supported by tanks, including the new flamethrowing model that shot its napalm well into caves. Kojo's skeleton crew of spotters on the forward slope would relay their coordinates to those waiting on the rear one, and mortar crews would fire until the Americans pulled back. The same sequence was usually repeated in the afternoon, after which the defenders would take cover for the enemy's late afternoon artillery and naval bombardment. Kojo's strongest contribution to the surprisingly powerful defence was a novel use of the knee mortar, as it came to be known from its height. Early in the war, Americans erroneously thought it was braced against the leg or knee for firing, which may also account for the name. Because the very light, simple weapon could fire its two-inch projectile almost straight up and down, it could be used at extremely close range and almost any angle. It was deadly just where American mortars, of which the smallest was almost twice the size, had to stop firing for fear of hitting their own troops. American infantrymen on Okinawa had already developed a hatred for Japanese mortars, which could be carried anywhere by a single man, fired from safe positions, and quickly moved to avoid retaliation once their location was spotted. Knee mortars, the clever little version that could drop their shells right on your head, that's how accurate they were, rated special loathing. Whenever we evacuated wounded over open ground, an American would remember. We ran like hell because they could almost pinpoint the stretcher. Each Japanese infantry platoon had a squad of four knee mortars, and there were three platoons in a company, three companies in Kojo's battalion. But instead of the usual deployment under the platoon leaders, he concentrated the 36 weapons into one unit under his personal command, producing what American military historians would call an exceptionally effective system of concentrating fire. Although some 24th Division artillery was still operational, each firing revealed the gun's position, provoking far heavier return fire from American planes and rocket launchers, as well as the land and naval cannon. The guns were also virtually immobile in the caves into which they were pulled back after their scant few rounds, because the 32nd Army was unable to shift troops, let alone trucks, anywhere during daylight. By early May, the planes would pounce on a single soldier who moved, not to mention gun crews trying to take up new positions. That lack of support from other units made Kojo's knee mortars even more important to him. His machine guns, easily concealed and fired from very low to the ground, were also highly effective. Day after day, 10 or 15 second bursts from his dozen skillfully deployed guns cut down lead Americans, after which the main body of the advance generally retreated. Unless American tanks joined the push, the defenders sometimes achieved brief equality in equipment in such encounters, because the attackers had only the armament they could carry, and heavy artillery support had to cease for fear of causing own fire casualties. Americans had been repeatedly assured they were superior to the enemy in every way, able to lick them hands down when it comes to the fighting, as their pre-invasion briefing assured them. But it wasn't nearly so easy when it came closer to a fair fight of man against almost equally armed man. 
Kojo's men learned to rush to the surface and prepare for those close encounters the instant bombardments let up. On May 3rd, the battalion helped shred a major assault on the ridge. The captain reckoned he could check the advance of an entire battalion if just two or three machine guns remained operable, for the Americans seemed attached to fighting by the clock and with great caution and concern for their lives. It was, he thought, as if they were engaged in some gigantic industrial operation instead of mounting the all-out, go-for-broke attack that would have won them quick victory. What a gift to his tactics. Lower-ranking Japanese shared his puzzlement over American prudence. A soldier at the eastern anchor of the same line, also under siege by an army unit, observed that Americans never made surprise attacks. First of all, they provide a protected zone, construct roads, put up a bridge if it's down, level a wide area for parking their vehicles, which are loaded with weapons and supplies. Once that solid base of operations is established, they start advancing one step at a time, in what an American military historian would compare to the movement of the tireless inchworm. Such creeping advances usually pertained more to army than to marine tactics, but not on the Shuri line in May. Still, the advance is like a mountain moving slowly at you. Against that, our resistance is like a child playing with a little firecracker, so we have to retreat. Kojo, however, was unimpressed with anything American apart from the lavish materiel. He speculated that any Japanese unit on the offensive there would have gone for the jugular, whatever the casualties. The perceived American unwillingness to sacrifice lives also surprised his men. Many Japanese elsewhere on Okinawa were taken by American bravery, of pilots who dived through anti-aircraft barrages, for example, and silently noted the falseness of their teaching about their enemy's softness and weakness. At Kochi, however, even Kojo's privates considered them too cautious. At the same time, they were envious that the only time Americans did seem to take risks was to recover their dead and wounded. They themselves were so short of supplies that they were forced to look at corpses, their own as well as American, as sources of useful items, from weapons to rations. Apart from the few forward observers, the men lived in their unimproved caves during daylight. Two miles southwest, the thousand occupants of the less crowded and incomparably better equipped 32nd Army headquarters under Shuri Castle lived like a higher species of underground animal. Night barely differed from day in the deep, dank tunnel with its warren of companionways and smell of disinfectant from the medical centre. The air was foul. The lights were permanently on. Disorientation was inevitable. Half-naked off-watch soldiers snored in shared berths or on mouldy bales of rice. Underground water soaked the lowest berths, but some who shared them liked the relief from the stifling heat. Even Colonel Yahara, Ushijima's gifted operations officer, who had planned the defence from underground, began to feel he was being dragged to the bottom of hell. But everyone derived some strength from the lantern-lit slogans on the walls. Be a shield to your emperor. Don't die until you annihilate your foes. Stick to your guns until you die. Kojo's troops were doing the latter from suffocating caves that made all those behind the lines luxurious by comparison. They reeked of smoke, gunpowder, and the human odours of men long unwashed and under supreme stress. The purgatory's final physical and psychological touches were scores of moaning, severely wounded men inside and hundreds of corpses just outside, but the living soldiered on with little surprise. Surrender was never considered. Even if they could somehow arrange to meet Americans for that, it would only bring a more hideous death most Japanese remaining convinced that the enemy yearned to kill them in monstrous ways. And if Japan lost the war, Americans would torture, mutilate and drastically depopulate the homeland. Even the one in a thousand who disapproved of Japanese militarism knew prisoner of war was an abominable phrase. As one such rare exception put it, dishonour that would make him afraid to face friends and relatives, if he'd ever have that chance, given that he might be taken to America for a life of hard labour. A few bold thinkers speculated that surrender's shame might be lessened if Japan lost the war, in which case the emperor too would become a prisoner. But 99% remained convinced that surrender would hasten of everything sacred by barbarians who hated beautiful Japan.
such a life would not be worth living. Captain Kojo's stoic men had been conditioned, since at least their first years in school, to obey authority without question, to suffer any amount of hardship in necessary silence, and to believe that a display of will would overcome all obstacles in the end. Many were natives of the northernmost main island of Hokkaido, whose inhabitants were considered slow to learn but extremely tenacious. Kojo supposed they were glad to be fulfilling their duty, even knowing it would end in death. Few shared their elite commander's belief in their happiness, but most were proud that their knee mortars were exacting such a toll on the enemy. Even fewer cried, Long live the Emperor, when hit. But most were convinced that the bravest possible stand on Okinawa, with the greatest damage to the Americans, might prevent an invasion of the mainland, where their families would be at the evil enemy's mercy. And since Tokyo surely knew better than anyone that the loss of Okinawa would open the way to that nightmare, they continued bolstering themselves with talk of the massive reinforcements on their way to relieve them and or help launch the long-awaited counterattack. The 9th Division was returning from Formosa for a landing in the far south. The combined fleet was steaming from Singapore or waiting to pounce from one of the Ryukyu Islands farther north. New secret weapons were about to be introduced. The Americans' supply lines were fatally overextended, and they were running desperately low on men and arms. Washington was poised to sign an armistice on terms favourable to Japan, and so on. Very few soldiers suspected Okinawa had already been written off as a sacrifice to gain time for the decisive battle in the homeland. Those illusions accompanied a refusal to accept that the battle elsewhere on Okinawa wasn't going well. Even more than when Yamato was sunk, no bad news was believed, unless accompanied by direct proof. Circumstances enhanced the Japanese capacity to believe in the nation's divine invincibility. The great majority of civilians, raised on their isolated islands with deep mental barriers to the outside world, honestly and genuinely accepted their leaders' bizarre accounts of the war's progress. With even less information and more urgent need to trust, the 32nd Army had reason to deny the evidence of their eyes. Of course, some troops merely followed orders without much patriotism until their time came to die. Of course, there were doubts at the bottom of many hearts but to air them would have invited certain trouble. A soldier of another unit would remember of that period. So we all talked bravely. Looking back at that time now, it was as if we were on death row, talking about a possible reprieve. The hugely unfair American advantage in numbers and equipment reinforced the sense of mission. Hadn't Japan always been treated unfairly after all? Always been threatened since the arrival of Perry's black ships? Hadn't her need to expand been fired by foreigners' oppression? It also stiffened the conviction that Yamato Damashi would be decisive in the end, which was as deep as the Tenth Army's conviction of the superiority of the American way of life. That didn't free Kojo's men from a quaking fear of death or stifle their constant hope that their turn would come tomorrow rather than today. But much more than Americans, they were prepared not to return from Okinawa. Their endurance at Kochi and elsewhere was also bolstered by a desire to serve a better cause than individual advancement. With Fortress Okinawa seen as not only the home island's best protection from invasion, but also essential to Japan's survival, this most important stand of the war, as Ivan Morris would call it in The Nobility of Failure, tragic heroes in the history of Japan, became virtually synonymous with kamikaze. Virtually everyone felt he should indeed be willing to die for the emperor without regret. Their emotions, though not easily expressed, ran deep. In fact, their tendency to act on emotion rather than on reason helped condition them to accept the idea of extreme sacrifice. On top of that came the group pressure to do one's duty. Every American training officer knew men were able to function in battle because they feared failure in their comrades' eyes more than they feared death. That was even more true of the Japanese, whose dread of ignominy had long played a greater role in society, and to whom subservience of individual interests to group discipline was far more natural. An American battalion, too, might fight to its last man's death if its members felt their family's existence depended on it, but alternatives would surely be discussed – 
including surrender, in order to fight another day. However, even the least fervent among Kojo's men accepted that this life had to end before a better one could begin. A soldier who was later amazed that he'd survived summed up the mood. I never thought I'd come home alive. It was clear to us all what would happen. But we could do nothing else. The American offensive of May 11th to crack the Shuri line was still a week away, but 10th Army headquarters already accepted that a major undertaking was needed to break the back of the defence that was so much stronger than anticipated. In particular, the Americans' appreciation of the skills of the fanatics at Kochi Ridge increased. Kojo's concentration of accurate fire was too serious a menace to try to overcome in one attack. The policy of steady destruction with superior firepower would be maintained. But the Japanese showed no signs of being destroyed, despite pressure on the 7th Division to do that from the Army Corps' headquarters. In the second week of May, the utterly exhausted 7th was replaced by the 96th, reinforced and fresh from a 10-day rest. The new troops continued probing mornings and afternoons, and Kojo's mortars, now used only when the attackers were fully exposed, continued cutting them down. Tank-supported American penetration proceeded on both flanks of Kochi Ridge, but the 1st Battalion held on, now inflicting more casualties than it was taking. It was the kind of defence by attrition Colonel Yahara had dreamed of, with Japanese tactics and tenacity almost a match for American equipment and might. The enemy would pound the position much of the day, shaking the earth and threatening to collapse Kojo's little headquarters cave. But however miserable that made the recipients, most were protected and ready to move out the moment the bombardment stopped for the small arms skirmishes in which they stood a chance, because the Americans couldn't make use of their roughly 50 to 1 advantage, including naval and air support, in firepower. The 1st Battalion was reinforced by an understrength rifle company commanded by a Captain Kiguchi, a friend of Kojo's from the Imperial Academy and service in Manchuria. Kiguchi, a typical academy graduate devoted wholly to military life and thoughts, was exceptionally eager, cool and brave. Despite his pleas to join the fighting, however, Kojo insisted the slightly junior officer was his guest and kept his 180-odd men in reserve, until a week's attrition of the battalion left him little choice. Exuberant Kiguchi utterly ignored all danger, dashing to his machine-gun positions and occasionally to confer with Kojo, his requests for permission to blow up American tanks with satchel charges were so insistent that Kojo reluctantly succumbed, even knowing how badly a commander's loss damaged unit morale. Kiguchi succeeded in blowing up one tank, but a close escape on a second attempt prompted Kojo to withdraw permission. As for Kojo's men, massive fatigue as well as the reduced but regular daily casualties were weakening them. When the enemy's evening shelling ceased, they dragged themselves to complete tasks that could be undertaken only in the relative safety of darkness, repairing their trenches, carrying their wounded to an underground first aid station, and supplying themselves. The work details would continue until the resumption of the shelling at dawn. All were incessantly thirsty. There was so little water that they had trouble swallowing the biscuit that supplemented their rations, and some risked leaving their positions in daylight to sneak to wells below the ridge. Otherwise, they carried in water at night from supply caves in the Naha area, two or three miles south. The handful who were to survive would fully appreciate the quantity of American supplies and equipment, and therefore the hopelessness of their cause, only after seeing stocks of them near their POW camps. But even now, it seemed to the battalion's remaining fighters that the enemy had limitless supplies of ammunition, while they were restricted to four or five rounds a day from each mortar. After a particularly successful engagement, a warrant officer happily reported the results to Kojo. Yes, but you expended more rounds than necessary, the captain reproved. A handful of Japanese ships had risked sailing to Okinawa after the 10 tenths air raid, but none arrived with either replacement soldiers or materiel after L Day, and the trickle delivered by air stopped after the first week of April. Kojo worried about running out of ammunition during an enemy attack. Like the drinking water, each shell had to be brought in on the men's backs at night, 
They also carried in their food, reduced to hardtack and a single daily rice ball, about the size of a fist, with a sour, salty pickle inside. Few were any hungrier than combat Americans, despite weeks of fighting all day and working much of the night under extreme duress. Still, they burned so much energy with so little replacement that all became severely weakened on top of their exhaustion. With no rest and, unlike the Americans, no replacements, the undernourished soldiers grew so tired that some began sleeping straight through the bombardments, 